which is the classic Lambic style. Uh, the term on the bottle is Creek. That is Flemish for sour cherries. Yeah, I see oh, okay. the uh, cherries right on the Creek bottle there. Oh, okay. K-R-I-E-K. -E what oh, you're going to get, though, yeah. with this beer for yes. two yes. reasons. This is from Belgium, this one? From Belgium. This is Belgium. Okay. More Sabit. Mm. We also have framboise there. That's the raspberry. But the Creek is the classic style. And what you're going to get from this is a mm. sour that? sort of tartness. Nice. Yes, there that's is. It's very definitely. refreshing and cutting mm. on the tongue. Yeah. And, um, it's, you know, it's not as fruity, say, as the Fruli was. No, it's um, very different from the others. It's got a sourness, which comes from acidic astringency, uh -huh. from A, being wild beer, uh -huh. right? And secondly, being aged in oak. Oh. Up to five years in oak casks wow. that are um, pre-used from, from cognac manufacturers, mm -hmm. actually, because mm -hmm. they don't want some of the stuff that comes from fresh oak. Yeah. And uh, it gives it a little bit of an acidic astringency. It does have. A little bit of a um, cutting refreshment, mm -hmm. I guess you could say. And that is the Lambic style of Belgium. And it's one of the more unique and legally protected sort of uh, brand styles. Wow. Or some more speed of um, Belgium. I think I prefer, okay, so far, mm. I think I prefer these two the best. So you like the Stiegel Rattler and yeah. the Fruli Strawberry? Yes, yeah, so far, yeah. Okay, you've had, you haven't had the Erdinger Weiss beer. No. You had the Erdinger Dunkel, which is the same beer with chocolate roasted malts. Yeah. You've okay. had one of the two Lambics. How about okay. if we go to this one next? Okay. Since we're talking about sour, uh, there actually is a style in Belgium which is pure Rodenbach. sour. Pure sour? Pure sour. Okay. It has Rodenbach. several different names. Yeah. Uh, it's called Red Flanders Ale. Mm -hmm. It's called Flemish Sour Ale. Okay. It's called Sour Beer. And uh, the Rodenbach Brewery, which is just near Bruges in Belgium, yeah. has been doing something a long, long time. And all they do, so it's not spontaneous fermentation. Uh -huh but it is new oak maturation. Okay. And wow. they basically make three styles. One where they put 25% of the old beer, it's called, mm -hmm. with young beer. Oh, another, they like a blend. Yeah, oh, a blend, and they call okay. that the Rodenbach Classic. Okay. They make another one which is called the Grand Cru, which is 66% old oak-aged sour beer. Okay. And they make one vat a year that they package and call it vintage. Okay, I, did oh, you, okay. I missed that, maybe I missed taste. it, did, did you say what makes a sour beer? Is it this um, glass? My Rodenbach glass is missing. The Rodenbach? Oh, oh there, it, there is. it is. Okay. Have a seat. Yep. So this will be 100% old sour beer as they call it. So this so is 100%. So what makes it sour guy? The uh, bacteria and the oak. The bacteria and the oak, oh okay. Acidify the beer and they do, um, from, from years and years and years of doing it, they know exactly how much time you know, to do it, to make what uh, Michael Jackson, the famous beer journalist from England, mm -hmm. oh, that's a different Michael declare, <laughs> he's the most famous beer journalist in, ever, probably, Michael yeah. Jackson, mm -hmm. he would call this the most refreshing beer in the world, full stop. Really? Wow. Do you want to try first? So, wow. this beer probably, um, more so oh, than some I of these others, is the missing link between beer and wine, ah, in a sense. Okay. It is grain fermentation, which yeah. is beer, mm -hmm. but it is certainly heavily reliant on oak maturation. It does oh, have a wow. bit of that sour. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it is very, very light-bodied, clean, crisp, refreshing. And oh, it's, yeah. actually, it's actually a palate cleanser, I would say. Yeah. Tell me a little mm. bit about awesome. uh, beer and food matching. What's your philosophy on that? Well, a few points I would make. Uh, number one is that in Europe, and not what we North Americans have come to believe, is interlocked with gastronomy, mm -hmm. as much as wine is. Yeah. You know, it's quite common here in, in Canada to see maybe a person have a beer or two before dinner and then switch to wine with dinner. True. Yeah. You see that a lot? Yes. yes, yes. That's a very strange habit from a European perspective mm -hmm. because they would say, depending on what you're eating, yeah. there's a natural pairing probably to be enjoyed with that. Oh, okay. And it may just as often be beer as wine. Mm. Some would say beer is probably more versatile than wine in, yeah. in, beer, in, in food matching. For examples being that, you know, there's a beer that'll go with, say, spicy food. There's a beer that'll go with dessert. You know, that kind of idea. Beer is actually quite versatile. And it's harder to make a bad match than a good match. Mm -hmm. But okay. only your taste buds can, you know, decide sort of thing. Okay. So there's no... 
exact right and wrong way. Right. It's 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 to be enjoyed so together. So people should okay. explore mm -hmm. having maybe explore, like we do wine tasting experiment. dinners, buy a different bunch of different uh, different beers and. And, and believe me, we should, we should do a beer taste. I've been. Do I would love to. Dinner. You can. You could do one with cheese as well. I, yeah. I went through a whole seminar in Belgium, and I forget the name of the profession, but one of the last two guys in Belgium who actually, as a profession, ages cheese. Uh huh. He brought 16 cheeses. We had 16 beers. We split into groups. We tasted everything and made a graph of what things worked and what things didn't, oh. and it made a clear pattern. Wow. Actually, so um, what we learned from that was. There's a right beer for every cheese, mm, basically, yes, yeah. and it's it's equally as enjoyable, I would say, mm -hmm. as as uh, wine and cheese tasting. That's very cool. Is there anywhere on your site or where if somebody wanted to do such a tasting? Like, I think that's really intriguing, actually. That would be a Matching fun evening. Matching cheeses it with beers, be. so, you know, instead of rather if you don't have to do a whole beer tasting dinner, but the cheese with the beer, I think would be mm. really fun. Like, where how would somebody go about doing that, guy? Well, I would say just do what I just described, but there is stuff on our website that points yeah. in these directions of food and beer pairing. Okay. And I'll just finish up on food and beer pairing with, um, I, I went and took some courses in Belgium. Guess what? At the University of Louvain, they have a faculty of beer and food tasting, basically. Okay. <laughs> wow. Uh, that's, that's how seriously they take their beer over there. Mm -hmm. And um, they talked about three words that start with the letter C, which are cut, complement, and contrast. And these are just three descriptions of uh, uh, ways of pairing, I uh -huh. guess. Okay. And I would say the Belgians rely most heavily, and I, I um, agree with this from my experience. Compliment is the biggie. Uh -huh. And okay. compliment's very simple. Everyone loves a compliment. Compliment is very simple. <laughs> it means that um, with uh, delicate foods, yeah. say such as fish, mm -hmm. you probably want a delicate beer. Uh -huh. You might want a wheat beer. So you know, okay. the first time I went to Germany and Belgium, um, and, and they were going to serve a wheat beer, you'd be having it with salmon or something like that. Okay. It's just a natural thing they do. Right. Okay. On the other end of the scale, if I go to the far right end of the table, and we yeah. will open that beer in a second, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you would have a beer that's much more robust, uh -huh. much more flavor intense, very complex, very flavorful, very aromatic, with strong cheese of character, and say, uh, intense foods such as red meat and stews. So would you equate then um, lagers like, as, like to a white wine? So things that you might traditionally pair with white wine, you might traditionally pair more with a lager. And yeah, I think that's a very simple rule. Kind of, like it's a very simple rule because in, in North America, more people are familiar with wine and food pairing. Yes. Yeah. So to get you started, I would give an oversimplified suggestion okay. of, yeah, think a lager as white wine. Think of ale as red wine, okay. and that'll get you started. Yeah, right? well, you have to start That's somewhere. Cool. So yeah. I want to show you a beer I just poured. Okay. It's the, uh, I think it's the first lager we poured. And we talked earlier about the difference between lager and ale. Yep. Yeah. And another thing you're going to get here is this is 100% barley. Every beer we've tasted okay. so far, every beer we've tasted so far is made with wheat. Sweet. Okay. So if you know nothing mm. else about a beer, mm -hmm. so this is a beer 101 thing, not a myth bust. Okay. But a beer 101 thing is, all things being equal, wheat beer will be lighter in taste. And okay. it's very simply because barley has a stronger taste than wheat. Oh, than wheat. Okay. So it's, it's going to be a little more colorful yeah. in terms of uh, you know, being light colored, but more taste intent or more color and taste intense, let's say, than uh, uh, wheat. So That's a big glass of beer. Bavarian Ooh. purity law, meaning four, four ingredients, ingredients. <laughs> bottom fermentation, yeah. meaning it's lager. Mm -hmm. And uh, as any good lager would be, served in a glass that's much taller than wide at the top because they want to okay. concentrate the hop notes. Mm -hmm. Because it is actually There's a, lot a, of similarities a blander beer in a sense, a beer. blander beer. But because you've been tasting wheat beers up to now, yeah. this will taste the most beery. Oh, okay. So I've, If I could say that word. Can I say I probably won't like this? No, you I, can't say that. I can't. Okay, You're not allowed. <laughs> edit, edit. The I, knight says, I, oh. I would, I would always say, taste it first. Yeah. Okay. Before you right. say that. Stop prejudging. Well, I know. Okay. I sh okay. So I'm just kind of going by but this my will history. Be, this will be closer to what you associate with beer. Okay. This is lager, and it's the most common style in the world now. But what's special about this lager is the Bavarian Purity Law. 100% barley. It's going to be round, smooth, and sweet with a clean finish. It's not as bitter as uh, what I'm used to when I've had. No. But it is more bitter than every beer you've had today. Yes, here. but yeah. it's not what I was expecting because I've, I've had some beers like, mm, I don't like them too bitter. In, in my uh, humble opinion, that's yeah. a perfect lager. That's, just, yeah. that's what lager is meant to taste like. Okay. 
And that's clean, crisp, refreshing. And that's why it's the favorite beer style in the world probably today, mm. is, is that. Wow. So, and now the last Grand, Grand awesome. Spectat. You were saying yeah. this one is, what, from the ninth century, this beer? Actually, you're almost right. It's, it's uh, 950 years old, which actually means the, um, I guess, 11th uh, century. 11th, 11th yeah. century. <laughs> but you're close. <laughs> Whoops! Woo! It's it's getting uh -oh. warm in here. Uh -oh. it's, getting, it's getting rid of all Whoa. that gas. Okay. It's been waiting many many years to be opened. <laughs> one, be, before I pour this, one thing I haven't touched on yet is that some of these beers are bottle fermented uh -huh. a second time. Okay. And that is because that is the ancient way of preserving beer. Mm -hmm. Quite simply, by re reintroducing the precise amount of fermentable malt food yeah. and a precise amount of yeast and quarantining the temperature for a specified period of time. Fermentation restarts in the bottle, like for instance with Erdinger, and also will be the case here with Aflagem. What happens? Uh, the yeast cells scavenge all of the molecules of oxygen mm -hmm. inside a sealed vessel, being a bottle or a keg. And almost by definition, as oxygen is what ages food, and this yeah. is pure food, uh, it virtually cannot age. And modern brewing methods oh. have not yet found a way to do a better job of that wow. than just restarting fermentation. But that's something that's hard to do. That's something that is costly to do. Mm -hmm. And that is something mass brewers don't do. Okay. And I'd say generally in North America, it's virtually a lost art altogether. Many European breweries still do it. So Erdinger is certainly one of them. Wow. And the reason this one bubbled over just now is because yeah. it is also a, a second fermentation in the bottle. Yeah. And that means, you know, that gas content thing I talked about yeah. yep. will even be higher Oh. In so the don't drink it bottle. out of the okay. bottle. <laughs> if you drink, if you drink an Erdinger or an Affligam out of the bottle, you probably explode. <laughs> yeah. no, That's not a good. Thing. I don't mean explode. But <laughs> I mean figuratively. You will be feeling very bloaty. <laughs> so the pour on the Affligam is a uh, what I would call a decant, which is a single stream of beer. So I'm not doing the two part thing on this one. Ah, okay. And I still want to build that beautiful two three finger mm -hmm. foam on the top or head head on the top. You have to have patience. You know, you see these guys and just. But like, if I came to your table glass. and you're having a beautiful steak or whatever, you know, that you might be having that would call for a beer like this. It's it's like, like you're going to enjoy the art wine, of what I'm like doing. It's like the art of pouring a, yes. a proper so, glass yeah. of beer. So that is a very that good a very good pour, if I Absolutely. may say That's so myself. That's very elegant. Wow. Beautiful. You know, the beauty is yeah. actually yeah. stacking the head out of the glass. I, yeah, yeah, that's and you do is that a little bit of an art as well. It's a little bit of an art, and it's also though showing it's pure malt, because. Only pure malt beverages can actually have the structural rigidity to stand, the head stand out of the glass. Okay. You could not do oh, that really? with a mass-produced Canadian uh -huh. beer. Uh -huh. Well, that's Can't another bust right Can't do there. It. Can't do it. Wow, you are very knowledgeable about beer. No wonder they knighted you. Should, can we talk oh. a teeny bit more about the um, monastery? Sure. Yeah? Sure. So that Affligan Monastery is the oldest one in Flanders. Okay. 1061, they have brewing records too. Mm -hmm. uh, I go to the monastery every year. They only allow six visits a year, period. Wow. Because it's an active living monastery still. You mean, you mean six times a year people can come? Visit. Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, I take a group of people from Canada every year, uh -huh. being the good knight that I am. <laughs> Anyways, the white um, we get a tour of the monastery once a year and uh, usually around Labor Day weekend. And um, it's quite, it's quite un amazing to see. They make their own cheese, they make their own bread, they make their own beer. Wow. We North Americans wow. would go, ooh, that's really weird. Why do like religious guys make beer? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing, right? Yeah. But in, in, in Europe, with all of that richness and history and romance, actually making cheese, bread, and beer is, is fundamentally a way of preserving the summer harvest for sustenance for the winter. For the winter. Oh, and yes. believe it or not, the monks in that monastery still today have that beer as their nutrition during Lent. So 45 days of wow. fasting. Yeah, really? They get, they get the two beer. of those a day. <laughs> wow, so that's they, amazing. They made a beer wow. that is nutritional, yeah. obviously pure mm -hmm. and real, and very delicious. Um, it's, it's probably the most sophisticated style of beer in the world, and that's really just because of its long, long history. Yeah. Um, the monks were the ones who could read and write when no one else could, and mm -hmm. they recorded history for us. Yeah. They kept very good track of their beer recipes, cheese recipes, and bread recipes, and their hockey pools. That, that's a joke. <laughs> um, anyways, by doing that over such a long period of time, yeah. 
they've actually made what's possibly the perfect beer. Mm. Um, and when I say perfect, it's perfect because it is a big beer, yeah. rich in taste, it's an ale, mm -hmm. it's got higher alcohol, it's 6.8, it's got a lot of aroma, a lot of complexity, and perfect balance. And when I've been talking about four ingredients all day, yeah. there's a magic elusive fifth ingredient, as I like to call it, oh. which is balance. Uh -huh. And that is what you do not get from something either you make yourself <laughs> at home or maybe yeah. that's been brewed down the street for five years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You cannot get that kind of balance other than through a lot of hard practice. But practice so, makes perfect after So sophistication years. in the way it's served and presented in a chalice, which has got religious background. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That claims to be the top selling beer on the Champs Elysees in Paris. Uh -huh. They sell 80% of their production to France, which is a wine country. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing that's interesting is women love that beer. And my last bit oh. on sort of females in beer is I developed this hypothesis myself, and now I've heard scientific backup for this. Okay. Maybe you guys know something I don't. But okay. women have better taste buds than men. Oh, yes, we say that, that all the time. Have you heard that? <laughs> oh, yeah, <yes>. absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's good reason for that. But my point of it is, in North America, where you've been told that one thing is what beer is, uh -huh. and this is how it's advertised, yeah. it's actually not the greatest beer in the world. Mm -hmm. Opinion. Um, you would be quicker than us guys to decide, actually, that's not so special. Uh -huh. right. Or I don't like that. Right. Or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. On the flip side of the coin, and this is somewhat, I don't know, ironic or unexpected, but the bigger the beers get with mm -hmm. layers of alcohol, layers of esters, layers of flavors, and yes. they can balance a beer so perfectly, yeah. Yeah. you're going to be the first to know it. Uh -huh. This is good. This is good. <laughs> So it's women, our superior taste buds, right, guys? The superior taste buds kick in at both ends of the spectrum. Yeah, that is not so good. That is actually uh -huh. very good. Very well, on discerning. that note, we're going to have to uh, close the show. This has been an absolutely fascinating uh, time. Thank you for bringing in those beers. I, awesome. I, I don't know about you, but I certainly learned a lot about beer this afternoon. Well, I learned one thing, and I think in particular, and that is, you know what? I like beer. There you go. That's what I was hoping for. Well, we're going to have a bit Thank of a beer guy. party now. You are still young. You are still young. Thank you again. <laughs> I'm going to have this one. Thanks a lot, Guy. It was Thanks, such a guy. pleasure having you Thank here. Thank you very much cheers. for having us. Okay, cheers. Yeah. Pick your cheers. favorite beer, Pick Guy. Your favorite. Let's have a she's, got, she's got my favorite oh, favorite. sorry. But I'm just going to look tough and drink yeah. this. All right, water. there you go. Cheers. Cheers. To the beer night. Mm. Thanks Beautiful. for joining us. Beautiful. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.